वॉशिंगटन just a gentle reminder i hope that uh, you all will switch off the mobile phones that might help the speaker to continue his speech in style thank you very much uh, uh, madam and also thank you for coming i really appreciate it i can see some of the my former colleagues from the ministry of foreign affairs and i recognize my dear friend uh, ravi former foreign secretary and uh, also he served as uh, deputy ambassador in washington and also rani i mean chani our super ambassador in uh, in, the, in uh, china when i was teaching there she came to all of my lectures at the peking university and shinghua university and i have also the uh, it was on the vijay man former advisor to the president uh, i mean foreign uh, minister and uh, also i have a uh, distinguished friends over here thank you very much for coming i really appreciate it and uh, i just came back uh, from india uh, meeting with some senior officials uh, and to talking about the region uh, especially focus on uh, china uh, and uh, us and india the indian ocean so i am going to talk about uh, focusing on sri lanka so i do not have uh, any answers to any of the things i am talking about i am just going to open up you to answer the answer these questions yourself before i start this one let me briefly say that uh, after world war 2 president harris uh, harry truman said this there is in, there is nothing new in the world except the history we don't know then across the pond between atlantic ocean winston churchill said british prime minister said the fathers you can see depends on the fathers you can see backward that is exactly what china does they look so fathers by looking at the fathers backward therefore there are two civilizational states one is china is still thriving very well and the other one is uh, sri lanka also civilizational states is still because we are still living in the history and uh, all glories so therefore i want to talk to you about uh, this civilizational states and also india itself how to look forward by looking backward so therefore i want to share with you a few thoughts which is the unsinkable aircraft carrier of sri lanka i can't do it i'll do it yes so i'll do it okay so it is unsinkable aircraft carrier of sri lanka i have written about uh, there are two unsinkable aircraft carriers which i am going to talk to you a little bit later one is sri lanka i didn't introduce this word it is a former indian foreign secretary shankar menin 2016 said to the south of his country india there is a unsinkable aircraft carrier he was referring to the the phrase that used by dr macarthur and his father in the philippine i will come to that one so given this one 
we have a tremendous problem and challenges in Sri Lanka. I'm going to look at it, uh, that the three superpowers or powers play and what is it uh, interaction in Sri Lanka, what kind of options Sri Lanka has for the future. But if you want to uh, find the answers, you need to know the problem. Problem is not what we are talking about. It is not the debt crisis. It's more beyond that one. So I am going to talk about uh, this uh, interaction, the both political and economic and commercial side of it, uh, these three countries and interaction taking place here in these island nations. So given that one, listen, man. So given that one, I just wanted to briefly survey the past. The one is uh, just before the uh, World War II, after the Russian Revolution, <laughs> Russian Revolution, World War I. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, World War I, in uh, 1917 October Revolution, the British geographer in Cambridge, Mackinder, talk about uh, the power base. He said, who ruled the heartland rules the world. And uh, who rules the command of the island will command the world. This is his idea at that time. Remember, this is the Russian empire at the height. And the world is changing during the revolution. And he said, in order to understand the natural seat of power, we need to look past, like, like uh, Churchill said. And there are two kinds of wolf wars. One is the land wolves, other one is the sea wolves. At that time, there is no air wolves because not airplanes were involved in the wars at that time. And then the technology will make the difference. Technology is the driving force 100 years ago, and it will continue to be even right now. Given that background, American military strategist, he said the sea power strategy. He said whoever controlled the Indian Ocean dominate Asia. Actually, he didn't say that, but both, uh, both uh, uh, Chinese and uh, Indian scholars and military strategists said they said that one for budgetary reason they want to get more budget from their government they said there is a threat and we need to increase our budget and so forth and so on but uh, these ideas have a powerful impact on the way we think about the world this is the sea power strategy because the united states they are bound by the two oceans on the both side pacific and the atlantic ocean so america's sustainability and uh, power depend on these two, two uh, oceans. Therefore, they need to protect it. That is why we can go into the history. And Alexander Hamilton wants to have a US Navy, Navy forces and, uh, and uh, he wanted to have a commercial nation. This is ideas of Alexander Hamilton. So these ideas are kind of perennial in the American history. But looking at it, if you look at it, the, trade, commercial engagement with the U.S. is mostly in the Pacific Ocean and also in the Atlantic Ocean. So America is, is still continue to be the dominant sea power. In order to ha have that kind of sea power, commercial engagement, we need to have a freedom, national navigation and peaceful for commerce. And this idea about the peace and commerce is critically important when you think about how the Chinese look at the world. I will come to that one when I talk about uh, Admiral Chung Ho's visit to Sri Lanka several times. So then uh, the instrument of that power is come from the harbors and ports and ships, which you are also seeing in Sri Lanka that is happening as we speak from Hambantara to Trikomali to Colombo, which we'll talk about in a later. And access to those places, both in the military purposes, so the academic, uh, uh, economic and political and military purposes are there. Then how can Sri Lanka think about this dynamic at play? And how did they work 2,500 years ago when the Sri Lanka has a diplomatic engagement with the Europe and East in uh, 
2000 plus years ago. We'll come back to that one in a moment. So here, now China looks at the backward in order to look for the future. Then China, before European comes into this part of the world 500 years ago, China was the dominant economic power in the region. They have the Silk Road going from the Xi'an, the Chinese ancient capital, where I first start to teach. And then I taught in 27 Chinese universities and travel all over China, all the 34 provinces. So I travel on the Silk Road from the northern part, all the way to the Kazakhstan border and also to the southern part and everywhere uh, uh, in China, all the provinces. So there, when presidency introduced that idea, it goes on to the northern route. It is called the Silk Road. And the southern one is the Maritime Silk Road. And these two ideas together is called the One Belt, One Road, BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. And where this rejuvenation and history come into the forefront, this is as the civilizational state is coming into play. The long history coming into the forefront and challenging the existing power, United States. So there, they combine two different dynasties. One is the Tang Dynasty that's going journey to the west from Xi'an. Other one is the Admiral Chung He's visit from uh, uh, eastern part of uh, China in Shandong province, uh, down coming down the South China Sea and to visit in Sri Lanka three times. And you probably know the gold tablet that they put it in uh, Sri Lanka and now is in the National Museum here. At least that's called the not Indian Ocean, but Western Ocean. This is to remember, this is the Western Ocean in Chinese literature, in Chinese poetry, even before Admiral Ching He came in the, during the Ming Dynasty. So now there are two dynasties to come together in a BRI. One is the Tang Dynasty, is that the northern route that goes all the way to Netherlands, Amsterdam. Other one is the South China Sea, all the way to go to the Athens on the Maritime Silk Road, which comes under the Ming Dynasty. Two together, now they combine these ideas. Natural power is integrated into the way China look at the future because China was the power at that time before European came to colonize the, this region. So given this, China has a dual strategy. This coming in a two different ways. One is a geopolitic and another one is a geoeconomic. I would like you to think about it, the two ideas together is a, it's the economic security. If you don't have a security, you don't have an economic side. If you don't have economic security, you don't have a human security. This is a intertwined. So geopolitics and geoeconomic is integrated in the China, look at the, its power projection to the world. This is part of the way America went wrong. So I will talk about that there in the later. So what is the China's strategy to bring that uh, national rejuvenation by the President Xi Jinping? bringing the history back to the forefront of the China's glory to the future. So a strategy involved two unsinkable aircraft carriers. One is called the original version, is Taiwan, another island, other one called Sri Lanka, the land of Buddhist. Faxi and talk about it. And I will come to that one, what Swan Sen said about Sri Lanka. More than any other Sri Lankan chronicle, even the, more than the Mahavansa, they talk about that one in the Chinese chronicle, about the detail about the Abhagiri and Mahavihari in, uh, in uh, Anuradhapura period. By the way, I'm born in Poland, Narva, and the great second capital of Sri Lanka. And I was a former uh, representative with the UN, and I had the privilege to work with my friend Susanta when he was uh, in the foreign ministry as the legal advisor. Uh, so I have a little bit of connection to Polonarua because it's, uh, that's where I grew up. And uh, I went to Sri Jayawardhanapura and I, from there, I uh, went to the US, uh, my third scholarship. So here, China's dual strategy is focused on Taiwan. I was teaching there before I went to Poland. Before I went to Taiwan, I was in China. Before that one, I was at Harvard and China Center. So given this one, this is the two strategies involved in East China Sea. One is to make it a claim for the territorial claim for the Senkaku Island, which they have a conflict with the Japanese. 
The second one is uh, Taiwan. Taiwan, during the Qing dynasty, they called it was part of China, but they want to reunify. So that is the national rejuvenation part, bringing that history to the forefront. Needed to say, we need to you reunify Taiwan into Chinese mainland if necessary by force. That's what President Xi Jinping said. This is the contention between the US and China. I will talk to elaborate a little bit later. Then the second part, third component to that one, South China Sea. There they created the artificial islands. And it says the President Xi Jinping went with the Barack Obama, President Barack Obama in sunny land, California. That time he said, we promise we are not going to militarize them. But they did. There are 11 islands. They can have uh, aircraft and the ships can reach to this 11 island, uh, artificial island. There's another artificial island is being built over here. It is called the Colombo Port City. And if you look at that one, the design is the Daoist. Look at the main angle on that circle. It's directly go to Beijing. How many acres are there? Hectares? Look at the uh, add all together. It's a Dao's hidden meaning to it. It's come to eight, number eight. There are numerous hidden meaning to this one that the design of the port city, which I can elaborate a little bit if you want to. Uh, having said that one, this is the one part of the Chinese strategy. The second part is the main one is connected to the Malacca Strait. If the Americans were to block that one, they needed to have another way to get the energy sources to go to Xinjiang on the western side from Pakistan or the uh, Myanmar side or to the Kunming in Yunnan province. So why is it that important? Because they are calculating. This is the way how China calculates. They want, don't want to have a war. They want to win a war without a war. So in that strategy, Sri Lanka is critically important on their strategic thinking. And remember, Admiral Shenkho came here. This, he came to the Western Ocean, not to the Indian Ocean. That make India nervous. When I talked to this one and a few days ago with the Indian uh, senior national security officials, because they have no clue how the Chinese thinks about the world. They think, Indian way, just like the Sri Lanka thing, the world, Sri Lankan way. We have all the solution to the world problem, not to at home. This is not a problem. This is a problem with Americans. America thinks the entire world is like American. No, if you want to understand something, think about how they think. Lao Tzu said, know the enemy better if you want to win the war. China does that exactly that. They think like a Sri Lankan. That is why you have a lotus tower. I will come to the lotus tower. In the Theravada tradition, you have a Mahayana symbol. I will tell you a little bit later the hidden messages for year 2000. 2049. That's where the 100 year celebration comes in the, the Chinese the, Communist Party. The, the I'll come back to you, sir. Okay. So then uh, this is a strategy here. That's the third strategy is put on the China restless stage continuously, putting the pressure on the from the south, from Sri Lanka, because we have the la tallest telecommunication center here in the South Asia. And they can monitor communication and networks, they said, of the peaceful purposes, but now they are uh, research ships coming in last year, the Wang came in, the Jinping came in this year. The survey, the uh, the uh, topography of the sea level, okay, with your NARA and the Rona University and so forth and so forth. We come back to that one if you want to, the, what they think and what you think and where is the discrepancy of this thinking. So this port I want to emphasize is uh, there is a constant struggle in Arunachalan border in the northeast side. And then in the Ladakh, and where the Galwan conflict happened in the northwest side of the Himalayan mountain. They have a pressure over there, and then Chinese and Indian forces are face to face. In the, in the middle of this wintry mountainous area that nobody can live there. 
So, and on the west side, then the CPAC, the China-Pakistan economic corridor that goes through the Gadwa to all the way to the Islamabad, to the north, to the Xi'an. Not only Sri Lanka, then Bangladesh has their own project with the Chinese and also with the Nepal. And Bhutan is different because their foreign policy is controlled by the central uh, central government of uh, India. So that's a, that's also have a, another doklam issue, which we can talk about. It. So having said that, uh, now this you can understand how China thinks about the world. And when President Xi Jinping and uh, Prime Minister Modi met in Wuhan, the city that uh, origin of the uh, Wuhan uh, COVID uh, uh, origin, I was there teaching. Uh, so that time they are talking about their friends, two leaders. They are talking about the Buddhist civilization interconnection between Chinese and Indian that time. I will come to that one and Buddha Bosa and intermarriages with the Brahmin and the Chinese uh, princess and so forth and so on. So they are very amicable. So China does that. China doesn't want to confront you. That's not their culture. They want to win the war without fighting one. So now this is where we are. Fast forward. One exchange to Sri Lanka, there's the three powers are here in three different ways, both economic and military and cyber space, and uh, also the telecommunications everywhere. Americans, Chinese, and Indians are here. On the example is the Sea Cells Island. There is a very particular situation. They are monitoring the uh, piracy and uh, trafficking and that kind of thing. But other one is the Djibouti. Is another one is the Horn of Africa. But the Sri Lanka is critically important. And if you see the what happened in the Maldives Islands, the new government came in and they pretty much kind of saw the I mean, finger to the Chinese, uh, to the Indian, and they went with the Chinese. That's where the money is. I will come back to the follow the money issue situation. Then it is another critical part for the Sri Lankan to think about. It is uh, 2036, the Diogo Garcia contract lease is going to be ended with the British. They need to find the another military base. Sri Lanka is what they call the nice real estate, according to the former Trump administration national security director. She who was here and he was debriefing over there. So that is the how the American thinks about this one. This is a piece of real estate for Donald Trump. But it didn't go very well in the domestic politics over here. They don't want to have it. And MCC is not going to happen over here. The corridor between the Colombia and Trincomalee, there are other issues than uh, the real estate related issues. So which we can come to those one. Uh, these are the details. We don't want to talk about a small fish and Maldive fish. We want to talk about a big fish. Because that's the one you see. You only see in the small fish. You talk about the small fish over here. But we need to talk about the big fish that shake the water. Here then, this is stage. Where are we going to be? Why Sri Lanka? Sri Lanka is a civilizational state. It has a long history, recorded history, both in the Mahavans and Chulavans and onward in the Dathasins uh, King and forward and the backward. Sri Lanka's foreign policy and diplomatic engagement started at the BC, came back Abair. And then uh, he started the uh, emissaries to Rome. Long history and diplomatic relations start with the Roman uh, Roman Emperor Caladius in AD, and uh, embassies carrying gifts from the Sinhala kings to the Chinese began in the first century. I will come back to Anna because I got interested in China because I'm from Polo Narva because the King Parakambaho sent rice to Mahavali Ring, uh, Mahavali River all the way to. Trincomalee, that's why we have a China Bay. We don't have American Bay. We don't have an Indian Bay. We have a China Bay. Thanks to King Parakambahu. That's, I'll come back to that one in a minute. This might be interesting to you because I went over there and trying to talk, uh, look about uh, the importance of the Trincomalee to uh, all the powers. So there, Buddhist path, the Tripitaka is critical to the Chinese. This is a spiritual anger. 
That's where the Tripikate was the uh, very earliest Chinese and Indian pilgrims. They look at the, this Tripitake is very fragmented, whether it is uh, Sanskrit or Pali or Indian Chinese. And then the Buddha Gosa is a Chinese monk at that time. He came to Anuradhapura, 5th century, to study about the Tripitake. Then from that uh, one, Indian, 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 uh, Indian, uh, Indian uh, monk. Then followed by the Fakshian or Fahian. Okay, you have a Fahian Gala in Kalutra district. And uh, he went to Gaul, and then they have one of the statue, Mahayani statue, very close to the uh, Gaul, uh, which is interesting. It's not a very uh, touristy place. You have to find, ask the local people to find that place. And there is uh, a Buddhist statue. This is nothing to do with Theravan. That's a Mahayana. It's in the fourth century. That's where he stopped first before he went to the uh, Sri Pada and end up in uh, uh, Anuradhapur. Okay, he spent two years here. And then Swan said, more importantly, he didn't come here. He came to Varanasi and there are Sri Lanka, that civil war, and there are a lot of uh, commercial engagement and Buddhist monks were in Varanasi and they said, don't go. Then he they wrote about... Hmm? He came to Thamarari. Okay, that's fine. I have time to study. So that's good. Very good. Excellent. So he went over there and they had the engagement. He wrote about this. So I'm saying. So this is critically important that we learned, I learned about Sri Lanka from Swan Seng's writing, of course, from Mahavan Seng, for sure. So this is another angle to see, look at Sri Lanka in different perspective. And talking about the Padma Raja, there's the ruby, is the radiating from the Buddha's tooth relic and blah, 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 all those things in the Kandyan kingdom. They, he wrote about it. It is not in the Mahavan Seng, another uh, uh, Sri Lankan chronicle. So this is kind of interesting to me. So then, uh, Swan Sen talked about uh, on Abegiri Monastery built in the second century BC. He said, widely diffused Tripitake. If you want to study Buddhism, go to Anuradhapura. That is the center of Buddhist knowledge. And that is where I have 5,000 Buddhist monks. And there are many nuns were there, Buddhist nuns. And then he said, in a, there are Sinhala monks. And I don't want to go into detail about it. And he also talked about Abhyagiri Mahavihara. They have a Buddhist uh, Mah uh, uh, Theravada and um, Mahayana was coexisted. Remember that one. During the Swan Sen was India, and there was uh, Abhyagiri and uh, Mahavihara, Theravada and Mahayana coexisted. That is very important to Chinese thinking. Let me compare that one circle back again. So here, Buddhist inspiration for both <coughs> Chinese monks. One is in the pre years to the early centuries. Then the Swan Sen was came in the Tang Dynasty. And here they were talking about Padma Raga. It's the pagoda of the sacred Buddha relics of Buddha. Fakshian wrote about that as well. And he was saying that uh, Buddhist monks come in in uh, more 21 elephants and they were uh, very decorated and so forth, so on. It is an amazing description about the detail of a Perahara procession. So here then they call this the brilliant flashing light. That also inspired Marco Polo to come to Sri Lanka, instruction of the Yuan dynasty, Kumblai Khan, to take this back because Kublai Khan is not a Chinese. He's a Mongolian. So he wanted to unify the country. They thought whoever in Sri Lanka unified the country because of the, this Buddhist inspiration, Buddhist relic is why this Sri Lanka is unified. They thought that they wanted to have this same thing. They can have this uh, 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 Mongolian emperor took the name of the Kublai Khan to Yuan dynasty and they wanted to unify the China together. So there are some elements of his stories come together. So you can see that why Sri Lanka is so important because this is the center of uh, Theravada tradition of Triptyche, Buddhist knowledge is diffused from there. You can go back to the why Sri Lanka was a uh, uh, center for that one, uh, Emperor Asoka's time to and the send his son and daughter over here to Buddhism is going to disappear. And this is the, the land of blessed nation, blessed island to be protected. So they knew all these things. And what happened in India and Sri Lanka is the best place to learn Buddhism. So that was the center for centuries. 
So Gavin says one, let me take to the much century, this uh, after the Andhradapura period, then I come to the, my own period of Polo Naru, where I was born. And there then the King Korokambahu and uh, Son Dynasty at the intersect uh, exchange, uh, uh, gifts and commercial trade going on, especially with the uh, Sri Lankan Parakambahu used the sword for the, his uh, kingdom uh, made in Chinese uh, and all those other weapons for them. And Sri Lanka export rice from Polonaru district, uh, Polonaru region. So there, more interesting part was, it is in the Chinese Chronicle talks about it, that one, actually there's a Professor Kinsley Silva, uh, Sri Lankan historian, um, whom I knew that time. And uh, he wrote about this one. He said that uh, uh, King Parakambahu also employed the Chinese soldiers. You can see the power of that one because the, our ships, they are all built in foreign countries, but it's, it's uh, landed in Trincomalee, Ch China Bay. And when he's going through the Bengal Bo Bay, they were attacked by the piracy. They were to have our Chinese soldiers in uh, uh, Parakambao's uh, ships. So he wrote about, it's a brilliant analysis about uh, uh, the Silva's work on uh, history of Sri Lanka, if you are more interested in knowing that one. So you can see that uh, canal going from Polonarwa and uh, connected to over here going to the Trincomalee and this is a China Bay and this is the deepest natural sea, uh, uh, deep place in the world uh, after Hikam and also in the uh, Vietnam. So I'll come back to that one if you're interested in military strategies. So having said that one, now I come back to the much recent years, 500 years. That's where the Admiral Chung He came over here and he pulled that uh, tablet in gold, which is very critically important. He used the three languages, Persian, Tamil, no Sinhalese. Why? King was Alakeshwar. Is he a Sinhalese? No, it's just like we say in, in the Nisankamala. There, there, uh, there are many Alakeshwaras. I'll come back to that one. Yeah. Uh, so that's not relevant to our story. Let's talk about uh, this one. Focus on uh, the Admiral Chang who came several times. And then, which is important, is this thing. He said, peaceful world built on trade. They are the one on the colonial time or even the prior to and afterward, never colonized the nation. This is very important distinguish the West. They came over here to colonize and extract our resources and take it back. No, this one very different one. They wanted to have a respect. There is the middle kingdom over there. There is the son of God. You have to go. Respect. That's all. And exchange gifts. That's a different. I come back if you're interested in a Taoism and a Buddhism, Taoism and a, 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 a Confucianism entangled with it because I taught over there. That's why I got the International Confucius Award from the uh, uh, State Council from China uh, for, because it's my contribution to China. Uh, because uh, they, when I talk about, they didn't know, know a, lot, a lot of people about Chinese, especially the doctrine of Taoism and doctrine of uh, Confucianism. That's uh, where Confucius was born. I was the professor there and so forth. So let me talk about the one exception to Admiral Chung Ho's visit. So there, when Admiral Chung Ho came, he captured the king, uh, Vera Alakeshwar and took his family and inner circle back to Nanjing, the uh, imperial capital of China. That's also a place I, I taught at the Nanjing University uh, several times because we have a connection with Johns Hopkins and Nanjing University, I was there. And uh, there you can see the open museum that Admiral Chung Ho's ship. His ship is so huge. It's the size of the two American football fields. Remember, this is Admiral Chung Ho came here almost 100 years before Christopher Columbus came to America, tiny little three boats. Remember the maritime technology at that time in the Chinese. These are tiny little three boats, mistakenly taken to the West Indies. They're supposed to come to India. Now they come to end up in the Caribbean. So <coughs> hundred, almost 100 years prior to that one, China's advanced technology, they have almost more than 600 ships, about 100 of them much bigger than American football team. They have astrologists, astronomers, 
astrologist and astronomers geographers sociologists anthropologists geographers doctors nurses you name it they have everything can you believe that kind of expedition voyage that taking place in the unknown place by navigating to the stars and the uh, maritime uh, surface of these oceans but he came so then he was taken away back into the nanjing then he was guilty because he attacked the admiral chung uh, uh, troops in court then uh, two years later in the prison emperor said this uneducated people of sri lanka the king they do not know the heavenly king son is in middle kingdom he doesn't have any respect they attack their envoys because of they are not not having the right knowledge we should not kill them because it's not a crime let him go he was sent back with the chinese emissary to rule sri lanka by the time parakamba of the 40th was king at that time he quickly eliminated that one and uh, was, alakeshwar was Sixth. Yes, sorry. Uh, Barakamba was here and then he was in the ro uh, role in the country. Therefore, there was uh, no issue of uh, Chinese emissary to take place and uh, Alakeshwar just pretty much disappeared. However, there are some, his family members stayed in Fujian province and Guangzhou province. I'll come back to that one in a minute why that part was very important to Sri Lanka's China's relationship. Now, there are major investment. This is a one way investment stream. That is where we have, uh, you have an issue with it. This is not a Chinese Sri Lankan issue. This is not the Indian Sri Lankan issue or the American issue or the Japanese or the other multinational organization. Collectively, it is a big Sri Lankan issue. Okay, first I wanted to emphasize not to follow Naru, I know Maitri Aya, sorry, mm, Maitri Pal, uh, Maitri Sirisena. So I call him Aya because we grew up in Polo Naru, okay. Uh, Maitri Pal Sirisena, President Maitri Pal Sirisena uh, went over there and in the Hainan Island they negotiated, they thought we have a kidney problem, I know about it. Grew up in Polo Naru, those days we have a kidney issue, you know. And uh, so he got this uh, 100 million do uh, dollar kidney, you know, which is wonderful. Okay, it's not too far from where I grew up. And then we have Hambantota and Colombo Port City is going to compete with uh, 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 to Singapore and uh, Dubai. And this is uh, another part we can expand. This is the, they are looking at uh, uh, 2035. Okay, and there's a more important part is the, which I said I want to come back to, Colombo Lotus Tower. Why Lotus? Yes, there is a, there is no Lotus Sutra. This is coming from the Lotus Sutra. It is a Mahayana tradition. Lotus Sutra is divided into three sutras, and the one is the Samatrabhadra Sutra. You probably know there is a monk over here, famous monk Samatrabhadra. Uh, and this is not uh, usually in Sri Lankan tradition. You have uh, where the monk come from this uh, that city or the village, and then the name. And then, for example, Polo Narua Val Rahula, like Walpola Rahula, coming from Walpola, his name is Rahula Mahatare. Okay, uh, at Sri Jayadanpur, uh, for example. So this one is different. Samatha Bhatra, he said, uh, I am Arahat. And uh, I can do everything. I know the, all the sutras and everything. He is. Uh, you probably see it in the uh, YouTube. And he is very different than the Theravada Buddhist monk or the Nikayas. So they had, I saw there is a dialogue going on, and he said, "Okay, I'll be quiet," but he's keep doing it. Okay, this is the traditionally known as the Theravada's country, but now it's a Mahayana being introduced, and China said, "Yes." It's a recycle back, it's a re-engineered our theory, and it is good for it, and it is a politically very good things to have. This way of looking at the world in a Mahayana tradition. So there is a lot of sutra here. Lot of and sutra. Is the name given to the original sutra called Sadharma Kundarika? It's a Mahayana sutra. Lot of sutra. Is that was the point. Thank Sadharma you. Sadharma Kundarika. Yes. That is the original Mahayana sutra, and it is one of the Buddha's word. But let me finish this. You know, there is a Danish scholar, and I am very familiar with this, who has done 
tremendous research. The point, and, point. The, because the, I have a time. Yeah, you are taking the, my time. The, the Christian New Testament mm-hmm. is work in translation and reproduction yeah. of Sadhana Yeah, you, you are absolutely right. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. But let me finish up and then you can take the next time over here. Okay, thank you. So this is the issue. This is the Lotus Sutra. It's a Mahayana tradition. Whichever the way is coming from. You can go to the detail and we have another argument over here. That's not my point here. My point is to, to ask you a question, not to give me the answers. I told you, I don't need to have answers because I don't have the answers. Neither do you. Okay. Here, now the symbol of Lotus Sutra, telling Indians and the rest of the world, this is China is here. Not Theravada Buddhist here. China is here. Mahayana tradition is here. Is symbolized. Simply speaks. China is but, communist. Huh? China is communist. Uh, no, it's, uh, that's we can come back to that one. What I work with the communist parties because they are nominally yeah. communist. Just like we are saying, uh, we are Buddhist, we are nominally Buddhist, like yeah. Burmese. Okay. So this is the point I want to circle back to. This is the China's another strategy. This is a they discovered the ancestral tomb. I went to see this place in uh, in Fujian province and uh, closer to Guangzhou province, where, where I also taught. And Guangzhou, this uh, Chinese lady is the 19th descendants of the Sri Lankan king. 19th generation. Yes. So you can Google it up and also I'll come back to that one. And she came to the uh, our uh, botanical garden and put the uh, bow tree and planted and all those kind of things happened in Mr. Rajapaksa's time period. And this is the important part. And uh, former uh, speaker Karu Jayasuri, whom I had the uh, privilege to talk with about this issue when I was here. Uh, talking to the Buddhist uh, uh, leaders, uh, so he gave this uh, as a symbolic uh, to to the uh, this lady who is a Sri Lankan and he's so called the Kumarikawa. He's a Chinese and Sri Lankan. So this is a nice way of symbolizing. Okay, we have a Buddhist connection, we have an ancient uh, kingly connection, and the Polo Narua connection, and Anuradhapura connections, and uh, uh, we have a, a gold triplet, and we have want to have economic relationship, and now we have a blood relations. Just like America has now, the, our vice president is Indian origin, Indian blood there. British prime minister is Indian origin, Indian blood there. Someday, 2049, before that, you have a Chinese blood prime minister or president here. Don't be surprised. If you do that one, that's what the, we are building a world in peace, peaceful world built on trade. This is a trade is not good than services, but good than services in our DNAs. We are one coming from one going to the same place. It's just like we are saying that we are Sri Lankan is a pure Aryan blood and thing. Take your DNA test. We are all mixed up because I got the Portuguese name and my mother is the descendant of the King Parakma, Sri Vikram Raja Singhas. And then my father was a Catholic from uh, uh, Jayala and they met in, uh, went to follow Narua during DSR and Ayaka's time. And I was born and I probably have a Portuguese blood somewhere and I have a Sri Vikram Raja Singhas blood somewhere. And I don't know whether I'm a Sri Lankan or Sinhalese or Tamil or Muslim. So this is the question. I have a long conversation with my dear friend and mentor, Ambassador Jayanta Dhanapala. He asked me to translate that uh, article into Singhala, which I wrote about the globalization of the Sri Lankan society. So how this, uh, our issues over here are not really issues. We need to think beyond that one, because in order to keep the Sri Lanka as a Sri Lanka. Uh, that another uh, issue. Let's focus on this one because I have a time crunch over here. Okay. Now let me talk about the importance of Sri Lanka. I talk about uh, you need to look for the farthest uh, backward if you wanted to see the forward. Sri Lanka has that one because Sri Lanka we live in a great civilization. We talk about the greatness of this nation, this island. China does that too. America did. Every nation do that one. They are the best nation. They are the great nations. Indian talk to great. They think it's a Sri Lanka is a part of the province of India. We are little brothers. They are big brothers. I told them, don't call them. They are the little brothers, big brothers. 
So how about the elder brothers? No, even it's inside. <laughs> I told the, the foreign secretaries and uh, national security people, please don't call them Sri Lankan uh, older brothers, younger brothers. They are brothers and sisters. I said, yes, mother, yes, brother, yes, sister. There are foreign secretaries who divide me, both sides of me. I talked to them. So this is the way we need to look at it. When you somebody call your younger brother or elder brother, you are downgrading yourself. Why do I? You know, we are all brothers and sisters. So that is the egalitarian system that the Buddhist nation has over throughout the years when we produced the first woman prime minister, an egalitarian system came to the show the world. And before long, before any other women prime ministers, we produced the first woman prime minister. When I met her, I told her and gave her a book, uh, and uh, she appreciated because you know I mentioned about her uh, and the Sri Lankan history and uh, uh, the importance of uh, uh, sending a message at that time. Having said that one, Sri Lanka has everything we need to have. Yeah. Unlike a Singapore, for example, they don't have anything. If they don't have a, a Malaysian water, entire Singapore cut down. No vegetables going there? No, nothing there. But we do have everything if you were to do something. We want to make it Dubai. Dubai doesn't have everything they need to survive, but we do. So Chinese thing, remember, they want to make Colombo, Colombo port, the best financial and commercial center and investment center, not Singapore, not Dubai here. They have everything, the comparative advantage is here than Singapore or the Dubai. What we need is the well-developed human resources. People who can learn, not to people who can teach others. That's the problem with Sri Lanka and other people. They go over there to tell to solve the other people's problem, not to look at ourselves. This is a problem everywhere when I try to teach whether it is American or the Chinese or Indian. You know, I tell them to look at it themselves before you put a finger on it because the three fingers are at your place. So this is a kind of thing we have it in the Buddhism. If you look at it, that is why I think it's, it's a Buddhist teaching. This is the treasure, that the treasure that Chinese came to learn from us and is still coming to for that one. This is the treasure that the Theravada tradition given the reality as it is. So having said that one, this is a blue dragon theory uh, strategy I introduced with my Polish colleague and she's an uh, Indologist and a Chinologist. She speaks both uh, languages. Uh, so she and I kind of taught this one and introduced at the Harvard University uh, early this year. And it's really earlier it was China's blue dragon theory. We introduced as a theory. Now, when we talk to the other colleagues, they said, Patrick, what you are talking about, and to the Antonina, what you are talking about is, it's not a theory. This is happening, isn't it? Why don't you call it a strategy? So I, I'll change it to the Rodagon strategy. So before I came here, I was in uh, New Zealand. They asked me the, after I write, uh, published that Australian article about this subject matter. So they asked me to come back or to the India, say, we don't know anything about it. Sure, because you don't know, because you think you know, but now you don't know. How come that happened suddenly? So that's why we think is uh, you need to learn. Some people think, so, you know, if I know something, I travel to all these places. I know I don't. I simply don't. I went to 50 states, 34 provinces, all the, uh, all the Sri Lankan and India, I mean, uh, Taiwan, and 142 countries, and work in 143 countries. But I'm still a student. I'm not an expert of China relations, but I'm still constantly learning. When somebody asks a good question, I begin to think rather than answer him because I don't know the answer. When he asks the question, ah, okay, I got thrown. I need to think, rethink it more. That's where the progress is coming in. Having said that one, Sri Lanka at the center of this is a struggle. It is not the military one, economic one, it's a larger one, it's a spiritual one. And uh, this is where these uh, two unsinkable aircraft carriers, what the uh, uh, former Indian Foreign Secretary um, uh, Sankar Menon talked about Sri Lanka, and uh, Douglas MacArthur talked about uh, 
uh, Taiwan. Having said one, I don't have answers, but I have uh, all the questions for you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your attention. Thank you, my friend. So the right. lecture is open to the floor. If you have any questions, so maybe some short comments to be made. This is the high time for it. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, so Tante, yes. yes. Yeah, you have a great cloud. I'm conscious. Now in China, uh, there are about uh, there was two day period of tsunami from Sri Lanka. Yes. And uh, yeah, there is that picture between the order. The current between the order is that picture from that period. So when she went to after the end of the country to Nancy, and the end of the culture of the the other one is that uh, the Kumi Nine. Kumi Nine is in Yunnan province, the capital of Yunnan. Yes, I taught there. Yes, go ahead. Sichuan Pan Nine. Yeah, that area is the water. Yeah. And we go to the main division to see some of this stuff. Yep. So they encountered the supervision of the king of the Lotus Kawam. They have to look at the crop growth of culture. Right. And for that, I mean, you mentioned the ship from the name. They came to my character, the picture thing. I invite for you to see to travel from travel from um, uh, the little boat, replica, and they she joined that in Poland, went out that way. So there have been a lot of stuff that you can explore further. So, when it's sitting is now in India, India has been pushing in Europe, as you remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as a, as a, as a soft power. Now, what is our soft power that we are going to do? Some of the heroes from these are put in there. Maybe the And I mean, people here have not been sort of discussing this or pushing them. And that, and I think in uh, uh, in um, UK, I have a feeling they trained in there also as a person. And uh, so a lot of area. Yeah, I have written extensively on what class you know, from Sri Lanka perspective, not from a uh, stream of her in the IT class in the Yeah, by the yeah. people. Yeah, American military religious. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, since July in uh, Warsaw, I think you know the book by Bernstein, you know? Well, I don't know. I'm not a scholar on Poland. Yeah, yeah. Let's get to the point of this uh, subject because of the time issue. No, no, it's not the time issue. How the folk and the CIA were the people behind you know, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another one gave that. Mm -hmm. So, it's a good part. And then, how far you would be there. So, and. I accept it and honor you, yes. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, uh, uh, just uh, ask the question and make the comment because other people are here. They are equally important as uh, uh, me or anybody else. What is the question? What is the question? Let me uh, get this one because uh, I have other things to do. Uh, very important. I work with your wife, uh, Hema Gunatirekka, uh, when she was in Kalani University. I'm in the World University Service. And she done had great service to this nation, in especially the Bhikkhuni uh, order. And uh, having said that, and she is absolutely right. There are interaction went on. I cannot compare all those things. I wrote a book about it. Okay, so I cannot summarize in 40 minutes about what I uh, the Sri Lankan uh, Chinese exchanges. What I have to tell you, the Buddhist order was in, introduced to China by the Sri Lankan Buddhist order. It came singly, singly Buddhist uh, singly king, and during the Wutishian time, Wutishian is the only Chinese emperors. There's other side emperors. So she was a Buddhist nun before she became empress. And then she wanted to have it. They said the women have the equal mental power as the men in order to get in the attainment of enlightenment. So she wanted to have the best people. They turned to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka sent the 600 Buddhist nun. And I went to that temple. It is still there in the northwestern side of the fourth ring of the China. And I spent the death Buddhist nun. Then about 70% of the both Buddhist nun have a PhDs. So I spent time with them and talking about this issue because I'm from Polonarwa. That's the time period that the uh, uh, Tang Dynasty, Wutishian was uh, the emperors. So that's absolutely true. There was an interaction. Okay, there are a lot of interaction. The gifts they talk about, what kind of gifts, the sword and the rings and the necklace and all those songs talk about. Absolutely right. So having said that one, it is not the one way street because there are a lot of interaction between when to these two countries throughout the years. What is the attraction? Attraction was that uh, knowledge base, the knowledge of a uh, Buddhist knowledge. But sixth century Sri Lanka has nothing to do with Tanda, yes. This is ninth century. Tanda, yes. I, I, it is much later. I said, oh, yes, yes. I was there myself. Oh, I, yeah. I, I can see that, and you're that old. Yes. <laughs> the importance of the unthinkable aircraft carrier you talked about. Yes. If America loses the aircraft, mm -hmm. and as you said, which I know, thirty-six. Thirty-six. Please, from the British, you know who knows that can renew yeah. it. We don't what, are, what is the probability now? The Yerugashians have gone against the, in the, in the British courts, but it has been squashed in the American courts. What is the probability of America being thrown out of the Yerugash? Actually, in the IC, International uh, Court of Justice, there's an advisory opinion. It's already. There's it's an a ruling that is a violation of. Yeah, but the other advisory opinions are not binding. So, meaning. That the American, the American view of Biden and subsequent people will be very different to the views of Eisenhower, Nixon, and Cleveland. Yeah, that is so why I call America. That's why I call America. I cannot compare with uh, uh, S.W. Bandar Naik, the DSA, and Naik, the John Kotalawala to the Maitri Pal or the Rajapaksa. Everything is different. It's part of the Buddhism. It's the theory of constant change. Yeah, but the, even the current Secretary of State, what he was named, uh, Blinken, he himself admitted no. that the immigrant power is very diminished now. Uh, uh, no, 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 that's, a, that's the know, side that's yeah. Go ahead, madam. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, draw your attention to uh, the fact that China also has uh, interest in uh, west of, in the west of Sri Lanka, and in a sense, it seems like the Indian Ocean has been partitioned into the eastern Indian Ocean and the western Indian Ocean, or the Indo Pacific and the Indo Atlantic. And uh, you know, if you look at the history of Sri Lanka itself, you know, before the European incursions, actually Arabs dominated the sea routes, and that's why Iranian incursion. It's one of the languages on the Zengi Stella, average with, with, with Tamil and Chinese. These are the dominant trade, maritime trade group languages. So um, I think I should sort of think a little bit about uh, what are the sort of Chinese interests also going to West Asia, the Middle East, and all of that, and, and sort of connecting to their, their strategy that you are mapping, because I think it sort of ends 
where the Pacific Airways guys are going to be combating the ocean world as a unified thing. From a Sri Lankan perspective, the Indian ocean world is a very unified thing. And so um, perhaps you can dwell on that. The second question has to do with um, down the sea data cable rules, uh, which are really central. I mean, if you click those data cable rules, the internet will come down <laughs> and all the stock markets that are sort of, you know, uh, sky high by loss of collapse and, you know, not things like that. So there's a whole uh, dynamic around Sri Lanka because of these undersea data cable rules all being on the sea there. And uh, so questions of also taxing these with these dot com companies and all the, you know, traffic, they made a lot of money and countries background. So all of those issues also kind of come into the fore when we're talking about you know, geopolitics and your strategy. And the last point is, as you said, you know, to give and take, uh, we really need to be looking at the fact that the US and the British and the French all have military bases dotting the Indian Ocean. Uh, China is trying to make its way through all these bases that are there. And uh, so that's also part of the, the problematic which we haven't really discussed, but that sort of also configures the way in which uh, China interacts. No, no, absolutely. This is a different subject actually altogether, which is a very important one. Let me just to throw out two ideas about to think about it. Uh, we always think that the Chinese strategy is to push the United States from the Western Pacific, which is coming from the all the military bases in Japan, South Korea, and to the Guam and Okinawa and to the South China Sea and the Philippines and so forth. All right, that's the first stream. Push it. And the, there are second one, which is going for the Hawaii. And then, then another one is going to the South the Pacific Island. And then, then there are two others. That's what is coming on the, as you say, Bengal Bo and Arabian Sea. And the third one is all the fifth one is going to all the way to the western part of uh, East Euro East uh, Africa. Okay, all the way from the horn of uh, uh the Yes, there are five rings. This is a, another strategy. It is I'm I'm so pleasantly surprised that you asked that question because China is already thinking about it and we are also talking about it. And that is why they have a Djibouti first. Okay, then we connect the dots and I wrote about it and I told the uh, people who need to know these things and this is how the Chinese think. And now there is a uh, getting traction uh, about uh, uh, the way how China thinks. You see? And okay. also there is this IIU, uh, so uh, India and Israel and United ah. States and, no. and, United, uh, and United Arab Emirates, which is the West Asian part which is uh, to the East Asian thought, which is uh, uh, India, yeah. Japan. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do, and uh, that's the West Asian thought, and this is the East Asian thought, and it's all about nuclear uh, submarines and military bases again. So, I mean, in a sense, China is really struggling in the Indian Ocean, ringed by all of these. Mm. China, China, I would say it's not a struggling. Uh, I won't uh, use the word, different word. It's not a struggling, they are striving. Yeah, what is the subject? What's the Indian? Yeah. 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 Admiral Chung said, yeah. to build the peaceful world based on trade. I can also summarize the same thing that where the America went wrong. And yeah. Americas in the founding fathers said then when they put the commercial clause into the US constitution, there are three words, is three people, three concepts are important in the two powerful word, commercial cause, commerce cause. This is in the uh, in the constitution, which means the trade with the 13 colonies, 13 with the Native Americans, and the trade with the rest of the world. That is why America is the global nation. Right. This is that they believe by looking at the history, both of the Roman Judeo-Christian history, they think if you have a trade, people don't go to fight. If I kill you, I don't have anybody to trade with. Therefore, I should not kill you. So therefore, I can live both together. So that is the basic right. argument. But they did not get enslaved people. They enslaved that, that's people. a side. Yeah. That's a very important part. They are not going to admit that. Professor, that's yeah, just that. one question. Yeah, that's the that understand. You have clearly brought uh, Alpha Tyler Mahan to the picture when you started the lecture. Thank you. I'm just wondering, 
to which extent we can get the insights from Julius Corbett, the other version of Mahan. When Mahan was talking about the sea power in the 19th century, in the 20th century, Corbett talked about the importance of the strategic sea communication. So what I see after having looked at your slides is China is actually using the blend of both Mahan and Corbett. So on one side, China has a tremendously increased its naval power. Now, China has three aircraft carriers, and probably by next year, they will have the fourth. Yeah. So they are planning to increase it up to 20 aircraft carriers by 2020. At the same time, they are trying to build a great sea communication network throughout the Indian region. So yeah. What is your take about that? No, no, you're absolutely right. I don't have anything to add. Uh, you're absolutely right. right. Uh, the, the, there's just one thing that you failed to mention, and I'll mention it now. You never said anything about pan Asianism. Pan Asia for Asia. You know, this is what Japan fought for. And this current president of China said, yes, Asia for Asia. Because yeah. Asian Asian region is now dominated and infiltrated uh, uh, in by, by Western countries. No, no, you're absolutely Asia. right. See, Asia uh, for Asia. Yeah, that, for that, you Asia. see, you're absolutely right. Yes. May I speak? Yes, of course. Thank you. You're absolutely right. My topic is unsinkable aircraft carrier in Sri Lanka, not the pan Asianism, not the Jupiter, not the Uranus, not the astrology. I talk about what I need to talk about it, but we can talk about how to make sambal or the uh, how to go fishing. This is not our purpose here. Let's focus on Sri Lanka, not the pan Asianism, going to Jupiter or the Mars. This is not our subject. Don't waste time. Let's get back to the issue about the cable. And this is a uh, 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 Ambassador. Uh, uh, Ravinath, uh, uh, qu excellent question. These are the ones we need to focus on. Don't go about what we know. It is not relevant. Go about what we don't know. That's what they are asking. Because they are the brilliant minds. That is the hope for the future. Okay? Not the dilapidated people like narcissistic people like know everything. This is the problem. Let's go ask these two questions. This is a question about uh, why the end game? End game is a very genuine, noble game. Both the Chinese and the American. I talk about the US constitution. There's a commerce course was there. China has, a, this is the same thing is about the built peaceful world built on trade. That is their purpose over here. How we are getting there is a different issue because their ideology, history, and mechanisms are different. Then where we have a discrepancy, argument, and conflicts. And coming back to your important topic, madam, is a very important one because the cable communication is the most secured one. However, you know that one in the South China Sea, they had the cable. The you know, South China Sea pretty much controlled by the Chinese. Now there are issues with the Philippines and the uh, Vietnamese because of the fishing issue. Now, the most secure telecommunication is not going through the cable, the satellites communication, but it is the cable. What the Chinese, uh, 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 the Philippine fishermen did was publicly, they went down and cut the cable on the sea and put it in the CNN and all the newspapers, sending the message to the Chinese. That is not even secure. Now we have uh, Chinese research ships coming here. They are surveying the landscape of the seabed and we are there because we don't know yet, because we don't have a technology. Even we don't have a technology for our economic zone, 100 economic zone from the from the edge of uh, Sri Lankan land. Toward. So we need to, to get that technology and the what is the motive? Yeah, we'll get our scientists, NARA scientists and Rona scientists, university scientists, but they don't have access to the data they are collecting because they are so advanced than, than what the Sri Lanka need because this is Sri Lanka is a fishing community around, especially North. And what China is doing, that one is a countering to that strategy. Chinese are now going to Jaffna and building roads and um, uh, schools and libraries and all these things. And China is using the soft power, soft power and going to down south 100 school and they are building a school from the down south and China is doing a different strategy. Because you know why? Because they have a remarkable ability to learn. Have you ever seen a Chinese teach other people like Americans? American goes everywhere. They tell other people how to do things. Chinese, no. Tell us 
what I need to learn something from you, best and brightest around the world, come and tell us how to do it. And then we will do it. And they're doing it. So this is the different way of modality of the new world works. Having said that, I don't know which are my time we have. Having said this one, one question, uh, madam, one question. just go ahead. No, no, there is no such thing. Uh, no, 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 no. There is no such thing, madam. Uh, now we are talking of all these, uh, you know, outside the land, beds, clarity, and uh, sea rooms, and so on. Now, why do countries go for this? Well, because of why do countries go for this? For power, for resources. Now, when it comes to resources, can you get a does China have full supply of reactors or are they prospect in the Indian the rest of the ocean? For okay, absolutely. That's not a dumb question. This is actually the most important question you are asking. Why question? I tell you a couple two ways of looking at the, this is supply and demand kind of thing. If you are an economist to understand how the world works, uh, China has an overproduction of uh, uh, their capacity. They have to sell somewhere. America had the same thing of the agriculture. Agriculture and oversupply of agriculture. I ate American food, PL480 program, and American biscuit, three posa. Remember those things came into uh, American school? This is overproduction. You need to sell it that one somewhere. Okay, agriculture production. China has the remarkable agricultural production in most uh, needed apparel system and the day to day things that we are looking at. And they are highly advanced technologically. So that's the part. Other part is in order to maintain that one, they don't have enough resources, especially the oil and gas. So they have to, to get them. So that is why we have the Pakistan, that's a CPAC corridor. It's a $40 billion project, okay, compared to what they invested in Sri Lanka. It's a huge project that uh, transfer the oil and gas to the Xinjiang province, on the Western province, okay? And then the other one is going to the Kunmin. Kunmin, this is going to the uh, Myanmar and cross through the uh, Yunnan province. Okay, so that's the one true strategy. Why they are going this one? So the economic reason. Otherwise, all the oil tank and the gas has to go to the Malacca, to the Singapore and to South China Sea. So they have to also have the control of the South China Sea because about 70% of the world Asian trade going through that sea. Okay, whether it is going to the Japan or the South Korea, it goes through this uh, body of water. So whoever control that one, control the region. So that is the power about uh, in order to bring that what their world was the world built, the peaceful world built on trade. Okay, this is uh, Admiral Cheng He's theory and thinking that was uh, activated. So therefore, I would say, uh, I try to think this way, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you are asking why question, why these countries fight for this and that one power and natural resources. America did that one. Now we are oil sufficient. I mean, the U.S. is oil sufficient and we are fracturing oil. We don't need to have a Western oil, but even though we import it. And uh, now uh, Middle East trying to find the renewable, uh, renewable energy. If they have a solar energy and other alternative energy goes up, their economy is going to crumble. So they are diversifying. They are looking at the sustainability and maintaining of the power. Okay, this is true. Being a, being a Buddhist, I grew up with the Buddhist monks in Polonarua uh, five days and two days with this, the Jesuit priests, Catholics. So I had a bit different way of looking at this problem. So uh, if you were to ask about the power, you know, we are all greedy. We want to have something better. Okay, and then uh, we have a Buddhist teaching coming in, get rid of that uh, Tana and uh, Asa and all those kind of things. And that is the way to look at it. And the Buddhism gave you some kind of perspective to think about the world as well. So that the, when you ask that kind of question, when you the great power struggle, that driven by the greed, anger, and jealousy, and hatred, all are there. Who said all those things? In the Buddhist analysis, they talk about the solution even. Oh, yes, absolutely. This is why I said, this is, I said, uh, 
Yes. Uh, 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 rare energy. Then the uh, main thing now they are even looking at the space, not only the here space. Okay. So th this is why I say it is the energy and natural gas and other mineral that what they needed to sustain. That is what the future is going to be. Because if the future is going to be is the one thing is called the chip, is the semiconductors who have a control over that one. We are all controlled by that uh, all our phones. It's the semiconductors. So that is where the, it's the next power going to be, not all the oil, but we are also other concerned about the water. I, Professor, I, just one, last one, last one. Well, one last question, can I ask you? Yeah, give the lady first. Say, uh, you know, all these rules that you are describing, which is quite true that China uh, wants to accept the, you know, the rules to oil in the Middle East. But now Russia is providing massive amounts of oil and gas, and it's we yeah. have the national border with China. So those rules might not be following more than Jim in some way as, as time goes on. And uh, in terms of rares, I mean, basically, the, China has by far the greatest uh, amount of rare earths in the world yeah. uh, than any other country. Basically. I mean, the West and the US, uh, it's very low on these, and that's also another mm -hmm. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, Ravi, go ahead. You have just come from New Delhi. So you have a sense of the Indian concerns uh, between the Chinese intentions, which are probably more long term, and the Indian concerns, which are more immediate. How do you see that playing out? That's what I mean by Indian. Um, I mean, uh, Ravi, that's, the yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. just yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a different a different conversation. Um, they are awakening to my conversation with them, and you, I will send you the today's headlines in the news Chinese Indian newspapers. What I said about they are worried about what I said. What I said is uh, they start the article, the Republic of Bara. In the G20 summit, Prime Minister Modi said underneath his name, Republic of Bharat. There is no India, but the Indian constitution said slash India and Bharat together. There's, they have to recognize. I, I, I was kind of uh, uh, really surprised because of the nationalism running over there. He's getting into certainty. But I don't think that uh, the strategic thinkers didn't think, think about the implication globally. So when they said uh, Bharat, China probably be happy. Indonesians probably be happy. Pakistan is happy. And the rest of the world is happy. Because uh, India is the only, uh, Indian Ocean is the only ocean in the world that na name after country. Why should we? They ask, we want to have Indonesian Ocean. Why don't you have a Sri Lankan Ocean? Pakistani Ocean, why Indian Ocean? So now they are going to talk about, I said, this is the long-term thing that if you see that one in the Chinese map, Arunachalam is, Pradesh is China. Radak is in China. They are going to put it, this one is Indian Ocean, no longer Indian Ocean, it's the Western Ocean. In the West, uh, uh, West Chinese Sea, the, they have East China Sea, South China Sea, this is the West China Sea, because it was in their literature and their uh, poems in the Chinese history. So this is the Chinese century. It is not the Pan-Asian century or any other century. This is the Chinese century. This is the Middle Kingdom. You need to bow to the emperor. No, no, let's give the dead gentleman over there a word. Point. The point is that I don't think shipping is going to be the issue for China. Shipping, I'm sorry, so repeat it. Shipping. Shipping. Not going to be the issue for China because in the next five years they do the truck can have and that's the end of the space. How would you like to go into space? Right? That's one. Number two, as far as India is concerned, India has a huge inferiority complex. You can never have a written history. <laughs> okay, all right. Then, also the regional states fighting each other. So, that's the part of the process. They have to fill up. Sri Lanka has a written history. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And India has a so that's a major issue that India suffers from. It's a huge inferiority complex. Then, talking about Indian North, 44 countries have 
So, what are the India? So, you don't have the video. Right? So, basically, it should be the video. So, that's the answer. There are this portion of the call. Some of them. Please call it the first number. Sir, uh, uh, man, I, I, I don't want to take side about it, but uh, when I read this issue that the inferiority complex and you are treating Sri Lankan uh, little brothers and so forth, they got uh, kind of a little bit discomfort with me because I said you need to treat Sri Lankan with equal dignity and uh, they have a great civilization and so forth. So having said that, may I uh, tell you, uh, uh, they might have dis completely disagree with you on the, what you said, uh, not inferiority complex, so the written record and they will bring up uh, their own uh, chronicles and everything is the uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita and all these the gold and all these kind of they can tell you about it. That has nothing to do with India. Uh, exactly, but if you talk to them, yeah. they have a different way of looking at India. Yes. Yeah. If you can improve geologically, the sand that the southwest monsoon is in, yeah. and the sand from the northeast monsoon comes in, maybe at that narrow point, yeah. that is what has created the sand. Yeah. Nothing moves around. Yeah, no, no, it was, it was, I seen that on uh, this analytical uh, thing about it. Actually, I had a very interesting conversation with uh, Sir Arthur Sri Clark, who wrote a uh, book uh, forward to one of my books. And uh, 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 he said about, uh, showed me those, uh, the NASA pictures. And he was bringing about the same conversation, uh, Ramasita uh, story about Hanuman thing, and then he was, a, you know, a, you know, scientific futuristic mindset. He was showing me this in his house in Ro uh, Rosmead Place about this uh, thing. It was fascinating, you know. I mean, uh, but meaning, meaning the Roman writes about it, the daily experiments along that yeah. sometimes sometimes anchor in the bottom. Yeah. No, no, actually, actually, satellite pictures are shown that one there. Yeah, that yeah. Is the sand that was brought by this the monsoon season, yeah, in the southeast and northwest. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, let's I let's think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to a very uh, respect, profound yeah. and amazing end of this intellectual dialogue with lots of questions and lots of dissenting opinions. And I think Professor Patrick Mendes has a tremendous amount of patience of bearing and answering all the questions. So. As a joint secretary of this Dedan Society, I have the privilege of proposing the vote of thanks. So thanks a lot, Professor Patrick Bendis, uh, for accepting our invitation and you came here from all the way within such a, a brief notice. Uh, we, we owe you for that. And also, I need to uh, thank the publication committee members, including Mr. Danish Bhutsun uh, Ms. Sharina Mendra, and the rest of the committee members of the publication committee who approved this lecture within a quite a brief period. And also the distinguished ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors and the media for coming to this event. I hope that you all had a wonderful and enlightening discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.